Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning to those of you joining us online. And happy August, I guess. So you've heard this expression, a sign from God, right? Uh, usually understood as some kind of action, some kind of intervention in the world. And oftentimes we use this in the sense of, I saw a sign from God, some sort of intervention to know what I'm supposed to do. And so, of course, this has been taken in some humorous directions. I like this one. Look at this picture, a billboard. Well, ask for a sign, God. There it is, all this time on a, on a highway down there in Texas, no doubt. How about this one? Me, Lord, give me a sign, the Lord. Bam. Or one I like even better, me. God, I could really use a sign right now. <laughs> mm, pretty good, right? Well, this phenomena of, of seeking signs from God and signs uh, from God Sometimes this has actually had world-changing consequences. One of the most remarkable of these is in the 4th century when we as Christians, we were under persecution. And our number one persecutor was, at that time, the Roman Empire. And then what happens, out of the blue, the Roman Emperor himself, Constantine, becomes a Christian. Why? What in the world happened? Well, the church historian Eusebius knew Constantine personally and multiple times heard the story from the man himself, Eusebius writes this, Constantine was praying and seeking the true God. He said, I wish to serve the true God. I don't know who the true God is. Eusebius says, look on the screen, Constantine said that about noon, when the day was already beginning to decline, he saw with his own eyes the sign of a cross of light in the heavens above the sun, bearing the inscription, by this symbol you will conquer. He was struck by amazement by the sight, and his whole army witnessed the miracle. He said that he was unsure what this apparition could mean, but that while he continued to ponder, night suddenly came on. In his sleep, the Christ of God appeared to him with the same sign which he'd seen in the heavens and commanded him to make a likeness of that sign, excuse me, which he had seen in the heavens and use it as a safeguard in all engagements with his enemies. And this began the chain of events of Constantine becoming a Christian. And so Christianity soon becomes legalized and not long after that becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire for good and uh, bad. Very interesting. Um, but this idea of signs from God was also present in Jesus' ministry, not in the sense like this per se, or like the sign from God. God, give me a sign for what I should do with my life. But rather, signs were present in Jesus' ministry in the sense of miraculous workings that authenticated him and pointed him out and marked him out as someone divinely sent by God. And if we cast our eye across the traditions of Jesus as it's remembered, we'll notice, like it seems he spent about half his time teaching and about half his time performing miracles, chiefly miracles of healing and exorcism. He was widely regarded and famous as a healer, uh, but also sometimes more dramatically types of miracles we would classify sometimes as nature miracles, something more remarkable than that. <clears throat> and that thread really continued into the early church. We see the apostles in the early days of the church marked by uh, the performance of miracles, which went on to kind of authenticate the message and show this was legitimately a work from God by the power of the Spirit. And we see this same thread kind of running up and down through all of church history as God has continued to do uh, miraculous workings that have authenticated the gospel. And it seems particularly clustering in places where the gospel, is the message of Jesus is making its initial advance in new regions and perhaps especially in the face of evil spiritual opposition. Well, in the month of August here, we're going to shift a little bit, and uh, we're going to focus on sayings of Jesus that I'm calling hard sayings. And we're looking at material that is shared between Matthew and Luke's gospel, uh, perhaps coming from what Bible scholars call Q, a source that we suspect was used by both of these uh, gospel writers. And so in the month of August, we'll look at hard sayings that are difficult either because they're flat out hard to understand, like, Jesus, what are you saying? We'll deliberately pick some of these. Or perhaps just hard in the sense of what Jesus says is difficult for us to hear for one reason or another. So this morning, to kick it off, we will look at a teaching of Jesus where Jesus gives us insight into his own miracles. And we'll see one aspect of what Jesus thought should have happened in light of people's seeing and witnessing the sorts of things he was doing. He, sees, he says that 
when the people in Galilee had seen these miracles that he had done, they should have responded in repentance. They should have entered the kingdom. They should have come to him, and yet we'll see by and large they did not. And this is significant for us too because our hearts are such that I think we are prone to forget what God has done for us. If you follow Jesus for a time, it is very likely that you've experienced moments of some kind of divine intervention in one way or another. Maybe it is a full-fledged miracle that you've seen or experienced or perhaps some of the more providential workings of God's. And sometimes these things really impress us in the moment and move us, and yet the years go by and it's easy to forget and to stop responding to what God has done for us. And so this passage hopefully will speak to us in light of this as well. So let's look at it. I put a handout for this in your outline. Hopefully you got one. We ran out last week. We printed a few more this week. Those of you online, you can download a PDF there somewhere in the link by the video. Let's start in Matthew's Gospel. This is in the left side of your column on your handout. Verse 20. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Jesus says. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So here are some villages up there in Galilee where Jesus spent most of his time, where he performed most of these miracles. What kind of miracles? Again, mostly predominantly healings, exorcisms, but sometimes even more dramatic than that. Now, this raises a significant, interesting, and challenging question, harder to answer than we might think. And that question is, what is precisely a miracle? How would you define a miracle? Stop and think about it. That's not entirely obvious. How should we define a miracle? So maybe you have lost your keys, and you've searched the whole house, and you finally drop on your knees, and you say, God, help me find my keys. And five minutes later, you find your keys. Or perhaps, like me, once when I was a kid, I dropped down on my knees, helped me find this lost item. I opened my eyes, and because I was on my knees and I'd put the beam of the flashlight here, it was shining directly under the bookcase, and there right in front of me, way back there where it shouldn't have been, was the item I was looking for. That got my attention. Is that a miracle? Maybe. Uh, What about you're driving your car, you go through an intersection, and... Three seconds after you go through, here comes a semi barreling along, runs a red light. You're like, whoa. If I had been three seconds later, I would have gotten creamed. God saved me. It's a miracle. Is that a miracle? Maybe. Or what about you get up this morning and the sun is rising. You know, we got the smoke and the sun is just so beautiful and there's hundreds of butterflies filling the air. You say, oh, every morning is just a miracle. The sunrise, the beauty of God. So this is just a miracle. Is that a miracle? Maybe. It's kind of hard to, hard to define a miracle. The problem is, if we use this language of miracles too loosely for stuff like all of that, it tends to weaken the real strong sense of miracle. So let me suggest to you, I put in your outline what I think is the best definition for a miracle. In fact, two. I gave you a short one and a long one. Here's a short one. Look at this. A strikingly surprising event beyond normal human capacity believed to be a significant act of God. That's pretty good. Notice the significant act of God part. Like if a, if a, if a one-mile square cube of green cheese appeared over New York City, it would be a surprising event. But it would be hard to call that a, a significant act of God. Would that be a miracle? I mean, it would be weird, I'll grant you. Probably not a miracle in the sense we mean. Look at the longer definition, helpful and less helpful for that reason. A miracle is one, an unusual, startling, or extraordinary event that is in principle perceivable by any interested and fair-minded observer. Two, an event that finds no reasonable explanation in human abilities or in other known forces that operate in our world of time and space. And three, an event that is the result of a special act of God doing what no human power can do. So if you find your keys after you pray for them, is that a miracle? Probably not in the strict sense. Like we say, okay, that could be God's providence. God's answering your prayer. But look, coincidences happen all the time. So we can't demonstrate that is 
a capital M miracle like this, right? Likewise with the intersection thing. And Now, granted, sometimes these circumstances get so implausible that it does seem to cross the line into a direct, surprising work of God like this. But for our purposes, let's restrict our terminology this morning of miracle to this sort of thing, the sorts of thing Jesus was doing in these very surprising acts of God that would not probably be possible apart from God's actual intervention. Now, why does Jesus critique these towns here? It's because they did not what? Yeah, repent. If I were you, I would circle that word. Because they did not repent. So as I thought about how to frame our, our time together this morning, I thought, you know what? As we go through this passage, we can perhaps see four silly things that sometimes we say that we should stop saying. And this passage will help us with this. So this brings us to our first silly thing to stop saying. And it has to do with this word repent. Now here's a super churchy word to repent. So at one level, the Greek word in the New Testament means to change the mind, to have a change of mind on some issue. And uh, in the Greek world, that was not used with any moral connotation. It just meant, well, I repent, and instead of going to Subway, I'm going to go to Arby's. Um, so there's no moral sense to repentance in the Greek sense. However, when the New Testament writers are using this Greek word, they're probably governed more by the Old Testament Hebrew sense of this. And the Old Testament Hebrew meaning of the word to repent means essentially to turn. So there's a change of direction. I've been going this way, doing whatever. When I repent, I turn. I realize, God, I'm wrong. I turn to God. There's a change of direction in life, turning away from sin and turning to God. So although they're using the Greek word in the New Testament, probably the idea behind it is more governed by this Old Testament moral sense of turning because this is precisely the sense we see Jesus and others using. And so this, this call to repent accordingly really is common in the Old Testament prophets. So when Jesus comes along and is calling people to repent as part of his ministry, he's standing in the tradition of all the prophets of Israel. As the people went astray, God would send a prophet, sometimes accredited by signs, and call them to repent. So look at this in the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 17. Look how Matthew summarizes Jesus' preaching. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So Jesus' expectation in his message is for his hearers to repent, meaning to recognize their dangerous situation, to turn from their own path and to turn to God and to come into the kingdom as is offered by Jesus. We see this as a major theme in the Gospel of Luke as well, running clear into Acts. Look at this, Luke chapter 13. Jesus says this right after discussing some tragedies that befell people in that area of the world. And he says as a punchline, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. So John the Baptist, Jesus, they expect this is the required response to what God is offering and doing in the ministry of Jesus, one of repentance. All right, so here's our first of four silly things to stop saying. Now, there's some terrible teaching that sometimes goes around in churches connected with ours, and this is like this. People will actually say, you don't need to repent to be saved. Like, sometimes people will fixate on this and make this a major emphasis of teaching. They'll say, no, you don't have to repent to be saved. They'll say, repentance is something you do. That's therefore a work. We're saved by grace and not by works. Therefore, repentance is not required to be saved. Um, what do you think about that? Seems like that would be news to John the Baptist, news to Jesus, news to the Apostle Paul. Okay? This is a terrible teaching. Now, sometimes they'll say, well, it is required, but all it's meant is only a change of mind about Jesus. Like, all it, mean, all it repentance means is just now I believe in Jesus. That's better, but that still neglects the real meaning of this concept of repentance as we see all through the scriptures. This is, according to Jesus, a key aspect, the key aspect, if you will, of the response that is necessary to come into the kingdom of God and be saved. Okay, what about people that say, well, all you have to do to be saved is to believe in Jesus. The only thing you have to do to be saved is believe in Jesus. How about that? Well, that's absolutely correct. If we rightly understand what is meant by believe in Jesus. If we don't rightly understand what that means, then that is absolutely wrong. Because sometimes what people mean when they say all to believe in Jesus is you just believe the fact that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. There, I believe that intellectual fact. See, I believe in Jesus. Well, wait a minute. 
Does the devil believe the intellectual fact that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead? Yes, right? He knows that. But does he take it a step further and respond to God in trust and allegiance? Absolutely not. So there's more to faith than simply an intellectual change of mind. Oh, yeah, Jesus is the Son of God. There's also this idea of personal trust and allegiance, and this bleeds into the concept of repentance. So what we should say, rather, is that faith and repentance are like two sides of the same coin. Look, would it be possible to have an authentic faith in Jesus without a concept of repentance that recognizes we're on the wrong path and a desire to turn and return to God? Absolutely not. Would it be possible to have a biblical repentance and turning to God away from our prior life and seeking him without faith? Absolutely not. So these two belong together. And uh, repentance seems to focus on that initial turning when we become a Christian. Our initial turning to God and faith ends to, uh, the focus of faith and belief seems to be where we end up, this committed uh, relationship of dependence and trust. So accordingly, notice what we see the Apostle Paul here saying in Acts 20, 20 to 21. Notice he's, he's summarizing his message here. And notice how both these concepts go so well together. Paul says, You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks, meaning everybody, which is like the two divisions of the world, that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. So sometimes a Bible writer will use only the language of repentance in a given place. Sometimes a Bible writer will use only the language of faith. Sometimes they'll use both. Sometimes they'll use only the language of being baptized. Sometimes it's baptism and repentance. Sometimes they'll use the language of confessing Jesus as Lord and combine it with faith. So the, the thing is, the, the response to Jesus is so all-encompassing as you enter his kingdom that there's different aspects of it. There's different ways you can look at it. And all of this terminology is acceptable as long as we maintain the understanding of the other things that it entails. So faith, the response of faith, this is not just, oh yeah, I believe in God. Again, the devil believes in God, right? But there is this idea of commitment, of repentance, a turn of life, a dependence on a casting allegiance to Jesus and a following. So, Jesus expects that the people up there in Galilee, when they saw these miracles, they should have done what? They should have repented. They should have turned. And there was some response, like some of the apostles were from these towns. But by and large, it seems that most of the people in these towns did not respond overall in any lasting way with the kind of repentance and faith that Jesus expected. So notice his strong rhetoric. Look at Luke's version, verse 13. Basically the same thing, but look at it again. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago sitting in sackcloth and ashes. So Tyre and Sidon, these are infamous sort of evil cities in Jewish thinking. Like, these are where the ungodly people live, right? Tyre and Sidon, there's Old Testament prophets devoted to kind of writing and railing against these people. So these are sort of symbols of unbelief and evil in Jewish thought. But what does Jesus say? He says, look, in old days, if these things had happened there, they would have repented. And you guys didn't. Supposedly faithful Israel. And so here's a very insulting, a very uh, shocking, sort of offensive, uh, in-your-face kind of rhetoric that Jesus is unloading here. Okay, but notice Jesus is not angry when he says this. We don't often use this language, woe. Like, like kids, you may tear your shirt, be like, woe is me, I must do the dishes, and you... Where's a pile of ashes? Let me sit on and I drop ashes on my head. We don't often use this language, but the language of woe is actually not anger. This is the language of pity and sorrow. So Jesus is sad. He is troubled by this because he knows what it means for these villages. Notice the intriguing comment, verse 14. They'll be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment uh, than for you. So here's a theme we see a few different places in the Bible, a proportionality of judgment. So here's our second silly thing to stop saying. It is very common to hear in Christian circles, and look, I've even been sloppy and said this myself. We need to stop saying this. All sins are the same. You hear this all the time. Well, all sins are the same. Really? Are all sins the same? Question, what is works? axe murder, killing someone with a literal axe, 
or lying to your girlfriend that, no, that skirt does not make you look fat. Like, morally speaking, which of these is more serious? I mean, clearly the axe murder, right? Um, even think about lying. Okay, what is worse? You get caught off guard in some situation, and you instinctively and accidentally almost tell a lie. Or a circumstance where it's premeditated, you think this out very carefully and craft a whole deception. Which one's worse? I think most of us have a sense this is worse. Now, you might say, well, they're both lies. That's true. But again, we have this sense that this is more serious. The reality is all sin is not the same. And when we say that, it really demeans God's justice. Because God recognizes different degrees of seriousness in sin. Jesus recognizes different degrees of seriousness in sin. Notice we see that in this passage. Jesus recognizes that these towns, the people in these towns of Capernaum, are going to have it worse at the final judgment because what they saw than the people of Tyre and Sidon. So as more light had been given, as more responsibility was granted, more was expected. Notice here. Look what Jesus says in John 19 when talking with Pontius Pilate. Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a, what? A greater sin. Wait, I thought all sins are the same. No, they're not. Look what Jesus says in Luke 12. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving of punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has, excuse me, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Think of the Old Testament law of God. Was there a proportionality and seriousness of infraction? Or was every single thing punishable by death by stoning? There's different degrees, right? Well, of course. Jesus elsewhere talks about the unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. He says every other sin can be forgiven. So can you be for, and I be forgiven for lying? Is that possible? Yes. Is it possible to be forgiven of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, whatever precisely Jesus means? Apparently not. Uh, likewise, in 1 John, we have the Apostle John talking about sins that lead to death and sins that do not lead to death. He says, I'm not saying you should pray about the ones that lead to death. So we need to banish this idea that all sin is the same because it really does demean God's justice. Well, where did this idea come from? Well, I know right where it came from, and it came from here because there is one very narrow theoretical sense where we could say this is true. What is this narrow theoretical sense? What's the narrow theoretical sense we could use to say, okay, all sins are tr the same in one sense? It's only in this theoro theoretical sense. Theoretically, all it would take is one sin for us to become lawbreakers and separated from God because of his holiness and justice. So accordingly, look here at this passage in James, James 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. That's not how our justice system works. That's not how the justice system worked in the Old Testament. But at some level, compared to the holiness of God, this is how it works. Even if theoretically we could do nothing wrong and do everything right our whole lives and yet commit one sin, that is enough because God's standard is so high and so perfect to condemn us. Now, I say this is theoretical because is there anyone out there that's only committed one sin? Surely not. But look, even here, does James even say all sin is the same? No. Right? So there is a narrow sense in which this is true, but that's not very helpful to us. Most of the time, it's better for us to recognize different degrees of seriousness of sin. That way, we don't get into awkward situations. Like, I've sometimes heard some Christians say, like, well, if you ever told a lie, you're just as bad as Hitler. What do you think about that? Like, that does not sound very logical to an outsider. Like, that is not very persuasive. Like, no, if you tell a lie, you're not as bad as Hitler. So... Let's stop demeaning God's justice by saying this. Here's another intriguing idea. Look here again. Again, we already read this. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, 
They would have repented long ago sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Okay, here's a third silly thing for us to stop saying. Maybe we're not actually saying this, but it's possible for us to think this at least. It would be this. God is not fair to those who never hear about Jesus. We might think that sometimes. Like, wait, maybe God is not being fair to people. Because look, there's whole people groups that have lived and died out without ever hearing the message of Jesus. I mean, there's people that live and go through their whole lives and die, and they've never heard the gospel. No missionaries ever been there. Or think of the people that lived in North America before we ever came. Anyone brought them the message. And it might be tempted to say, well, how can you hold people to some high standard of believing in Jesus if they've never heard? Surely that's not fair. Well, first off, we got to say, by definition, however God handles those situations, and we're not exactly told, However God decides to handle that, by definition, we know this, it will be absolutely fair and merciful because God is absolutely fair and just and merciful. But in this passage, maybe we get an interesting hint, and I just say maybe, and I say just a hint, maybe at one thing that will be operative in the judgment for those that have never heard. Look here, notice. Well, let me ask you this. Does God know everything that happens in the world? Does God know every choice that everybody makes in the world? Go like this, right? Well, what about this? Does God know every possible choice that every person would make in every possible world? Does God know what you would do, you being you, in every conceivable situation? Yeah, he does. This is one theory for how God's sovereignty and free will works together. It's called middle knowledge. God knows every possible choice in every possible universe. So notice Jesus seems to know here that if these ancient cities had been exposed to Jesus' ministry, they would have repented. Jesus says, if I'd been there, they would have repented and believed. And so it's certainly possible for us to think as part of what God will do in the final judgment as he weighs everybody on that day, will be, okay, what would this person have done if they'd had opportunity to hear the message of Jesus? And we're not told this is going to work this way, but it's an intriguing thought perhaps suggested to us by this passage. I like that rattling fan. If you guys, you want, you can turn it off back there, or we can just, it'll help me keep the beat. Keep looking at uh, Luke's version, verse 15. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. All right, Hades. You heard that word before? Who is Hades? That is the Greek god of the dead. This is the Greek word for the underworld, Hades. Um, this is translating the Old Testament Hebrew word Sheol, the place of the dead, the underworld. So if you read the Old Testament, God had not revealed a very robust perspective on eternal life. Largely, the view of life after death in the Old Testament was there's not much of one. The dead go to Sheol, the pit, the underworld. It's a gloomy place. It's dark. Your spirit there with a kind of shadowy existence, the Rephaim, the spirits of the dead. In the Old Testament, the wicked go there and the righteous go there. That point is made multiple places in the scripture. Ecclesiastes, the writer says, look, if you're righteous, you go to Sheol. If you're wicked, you go to Sheol. And so in the Old Testament, there's not much of an optimistic view of life after death. But towards the end of the Old Testament, we begin to see glimpses of a more robust kind of life after death. We begin to see references to resurrection. This continues to develop, and by the time we get to the first century, when Jesus is here, now many Jews have a very robust expectation of life after death in heaven and one day in resurrection. So in the Old Testament, language of Hades or Sheol just referred to sort of a, the place where all the dead go, good or bad. Everybody, that's where you head. But by the time we get to Jesus' day, Hades had come to represent rather a temporary holding place for the wicked. The righteous dead who were faithful to Yahweh would go to paradise, or Abraham's bosom it was sometimes called. And so we see this expectation even at the end of Revelation. Remember, it says the final judgment, Hades will give up the dead that is in it for the judgment. And finally, then there will be the lake of fire and hell, properly speaking. So what is Jesus saying here? Basically, he's using a very rhetorical, 
way to say, Capernaum, people in Capernaum, your future is not bright. By rejecting me, your eternal destiny is going to be grim indeed. You will not share an eternal life. You will rather be condemned to Hades, the pit, the grave, hell. That's pretty sobering. And remember, this is Capernaum. This is like his central area. If you watch his show, The Chosen, you see Jesus around here a lot in Capernaum. I think one of the gospel writers calls it Jesus' own town. It's going to be bad for you, Jesus says. Look back at Matthew's version as Jesus goes on. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Remember Sodom? Sodom and Gomorrah, the city in the Old Testament, utterly smote by God. It's interesting. I once sat in on a lecture by an archaeologist um, in seminary who is excavating what they believe are the remains of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain down there on the other side of the Jordan. It's in modern-day Jordan. And they showed pictures, and they talked about as they were excavating here, they hit this layer of destruction in the city where everything is just utterly blasted. And the sand's been turned to glass. And they said, we took some of that, and we had it tested at, like, Los Alamos or one of these nuclear labs in the country. And it was the only other... And they said, the only time we've found substances like this is at the nuclear bomb test sites. So something utterly hammered these prosperous cities right there in the Jordan River Valley, right across um, from the Jordan River. And Jesus says, look, if I had been in Sodom and done these things, they would have repented. But you, Capernaum... It's going to be better off for Sodom on that day than for you guys. That's pretty sobering. Um, One last silly thing for us to stop saying in light of the whole theme we see here of Jesus' usage of his miracles would be this. Miracles are not important for faith. Sometimes we we hear sentiments like this in churches like ours, and probably in, in reaction to some of the excesses that we sometimes see in more charismatic or Pentecostal churches. Uh, charismatic and Pentecostal churches have oftentimes a greater emphasis on God's working and miraculous intervention in the world, and that can be very good and healthy, but sometimes that can turn real wacky and real extreme. And so a lot of times in our churches, we've had reactions against that, and we've almost poo-pooed this whole idea of miracles. We're like, well... No, you shouldn't need miracles for your faith. No, you shouldn't have to see miracles in order to believe. And there's almost a, like, no, miracles are almost a subpar level of experience. Well, I don't know. No, no one's really saying that, probably. But sometimes this can be our instinct. I don't think we want to take this approach. Because we do see Jesus appealing to miracles for authentication. Notice here in this passage... What did Jesus expect them to do based on seeing his miracles? They should have what? They should have repented. Jesus saw these miracles as having an evidential value, authenticating him as a true prophet, a true messenger from God. And there's other examples of this. We saw a month or so ago, remember Jesus replied to the messengers from John the Baptist? John the Baptist sends messengers, said to Jesus, are you the one who's to come or should we expect another? And Jesus says, go tell John what you've seen and heard. The dead are raised, the blind see, the lame walk, good news is preached to the poor. In other words, Jesus pointed to his deeds, his miracles, to show the presence of the kingdom, to authenticate himself as the one who's bringing the kingdom. In Mark 2, we see Jesus doing a healing. Remember the guy that gets lowered from the roof? And the way it's framed is Jesus performs the miracle to demonstrate his authority to forgive sins. Uh, Consider this. In the Gospel of John, we have a whole theme of Jesus' signs, his miracles, done and expected to bring forth faith from those who saw it. So look here at the end of John. Now, this is not Jesus talking. This is the gospel writer in chapter 20. says this, Jesus performed many other what? Signs, the term for Jesus' miracles in John. Performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Messiah. John says, the reason I wrote about these seven key miraculous signs in John, or eight, depending on how you count, was so that you would believe. So clearly the miracles of Jesus, called signs here, are supposed to bring forth faith. Look what Jesus says in John 14. Believe in me when I say I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. So Jesus sees in his works the miracles he'd done. You should be able to see the evidence 
of God working here. And we see this continue through the apostles into the early church, of course. And bits, spots, and places here to today as well. Okay, but there is another side of this coin, which people, we can appeal to, and this is why sometimes people take a hard line against expecting or depending on miracles. And this is because we also do see this opposite theme in Jesus of a kind of resistance to doing miracles to authenticate himself. So we see a tension in this. So look at this in Mark 8. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. Okay, so notice, the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, and by the way, this is in the context of miracles already. They say, give us a sign from heaven. And then Jesus says, nope. So notice, here's a refusal to perform a sign on command. Why, do you think? He knew they wouldn't repent, perhaps, right. Because who are these? These are the Pharisees asking to test him. Are these Jesus' friends? Are they open to what he is doing? No, so it may be at times Jesus is willing to perform signs to generate faith and to authenticate himself, but he is not going to dance to their tune. He's not going to do this when demanded of him. Allegiance might have had something to do with it too. Everyone inside of truth listens to me, Jesus says. Um, another possibility is look what they ask him for. A what? From where? A sign from heaven. It could be they don't mean the sort of things he's been doing healings and exorcisms. They may have in mind a more dramatic cosmic sort of sign, like Allah, Constantine. Show me the burning cross in the sky and then we'll believe. Maybe it's, this is the sort of thing Jesus refuses. Interestingly, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we never see Jesus' miracles called signs, called powers, miracles, um, wonders, but never this terminology of signs. Jesus uses the word sign, but it's always either to refuse to give something or to talk about false signs like the Antichrist would bring. So, interestingly, opposite of that, in the Gospel of John, we have a well-developed theme of Jesus' miracles called what? Signs. And so some people say, well, there's just another example of the Gospel of John is not very trustworthy. However, if you actually look carefully, it's interesting even in the Gospel of John, you never see the language of signs on Jesus' lips. That is always the terminology of John the narrator when he describes the miracles of Jesus. So John presents this theme in Jesus' ministry as signs showing the presence of God, but in such a way that seems to maintain this remembrance that this was not the terminology that Jesus himself used. Um, okay, we also see other things in Jesus that show resistance to giving signs for faith. Uh, notice, would you say, as you think of Jesus' miracles of healing, most of the time does Jesus expect faith to flow from a healing, or does he expect faith as a prerequisite for the healing? Prerequisite. Notice, so plenty of times Jesus treats faith as something required. There's a comment somewhere, I forget where Mark says, he could not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. So that shows us that it's not a major theme for Jesus expecting miracles to bring faith because Jesus expects faith to exist for him to do some of these things. Well, there's also this theme that Jesus is aware of of the possibility of false miracles. We see this in the Old Testament test for a prophet as well. Does a miracle authenticate someone is from God? Absolutely. Go like this. Why? Because there's all sorts of possibilities for false workings, right? Demonic counterfeits and otherwise. Look at what Jesus says here in Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Notice how sobering. Here are people who said they were Christians, who thought they were Christians, apparently, who are performing miracles in the name of Jesus. And they end up condemned. And Jesus says to them, I never knew you. So here's another reason why Jesus didn't depend overly much on miracles. Because the evidential value of miracles is not absolute. All right. All right, so how do we put this together? Well, I think we want to be fair to both of these themes in Jesus. And in fact, we see the exact same tension in the Apostle Paul. Sometimes he appeals to miracles for authentication. Sometimes he refuses and downplays them. 
And we can see both of these threads running through the whole church, I think. So we want to find ourselves in a position that can deal comfortably with both directions. I think it's good for us to understand that we live essentially in the same era and age as the early church, the age of the Spirit. There's nothing essentially different about the time we find ourselves than when they were. So we would expect the Spirit to continue to work miraculously in all sorts of ways as needed. And again, particularly we see this in places it seems where the gospel is making initial inroads against opposition. So I think we should expect for this and look for this. But we can't conjure it up. We can't twist God's arm. We're dependent on him for these things as gifts and grace. On the other hand, we don't want to be so obsessed with miracles that it's all we fixate on. I mean, Jesus does say, blessed is one who is believed, who is not seen. Remember that one in John? So I think we want to sit there in between these two tensions, valuing and seeking the direct miraculous intervention of God, but not obsessing over it, if that makes sense. Okay, bottom line, what should we learn from this passage? On one hand, it's seems a bit remote from us because we've never seen Jesus' miracles alive and in person. Let's say this, though. Don't stop responding to what Christ has done for you. Don't stop responding to what Christ has done for you. You know, if, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, odds are decent. You can think back over your life and your time with God, and odds are decent there's been moments where God has done stuff. Like maybe you've seen full-fledged miracles that match our classifications. Um, I remember talking with one young woman in our church, and they were on a mission trip, a medical mission trip, and they were taking people through a medical tent, and then they would pray for them in the tent right after they got their medical checkout, and she said we, there was this woman with this badly twisted foot, and we all got around her, and we prayed for her. She said, my eyes were open, and I watched her foot as we prayed, as it twisted around and fixed itself. Okay, like there is the capital M miracle that fits our, fits our um, categories. Now, maybe you've seen stuff like that, and maybe you haven't. But even if you've never seen something that dramatic, there's other sorts of things we've experienced. There are some of those providential deals, like the key thing. Like I lost my keys or whatever, and I find them, and like sometimes that gets so improbable, it sure looks like a direct action of God on our behalf. Or sometimes it's something else. Maybe it's a, a supernatural sense of God's presence with you in a dark moment. So we, we tend to have these moments here and there. But you know what? And I've seen some cool stuff, and I've experienced some stuff like this. And in the moment, I'm like, wow, it's so cool. I'm never freaking get that. And my faith, I just love you, Lord. It's so... But then what happens a month later is I'm cutting the grass and got to deal with the cars that won't work. And you know, we just tend to forget these things. So three suggestions for us how to do that, and that's really the first one. By continuing to remember whatever works of God you've experienced. I talked to someone after the first service and said, you know what, for 20, 30 years, I've kept a notebook and written down stuff like this that God has done for me so I can go back and reflect on it. If you've experienced stuff like this, don't forget. Our hearts are so hard, we're quick to just move on and not reflect on and remember what God has done for us. Now, maybe you're like, well, I haven't seen any of that stuff. I've been a Christian. I've never had anything like that. Hey, we can't, we can't conjure this stuff up. We can't determine this. But even if you've never seen or witnessed anything like that, listen, if you're a believer in Jesus, you are a recipient of the greatest thing Jesus ever did for us, which is his death on the cross and resurrection. And you can turn your eyes there and your focus there in this regard. Second, suggest this. By maintaining an attitude of humble repentance. Let's not miss this keyword, Repent in this passage here today by maintaining an attitude of humble repentance. Now, Jesus is talking about an initial repentance to come into the kingdom, to turn away from our sin and turn to him and follow him as the king of God's kingdom. That's what he expected uh, the people to do after seeing his miracles. But we don't only repent and turn when we first become a follower of Jesus, right? A little over 500 years ago when Martin Luther, when he kicked off the Reformation by... Um, posting this 95 theses to the, the uh, Reddit of the 16th century, the door of the church in Wittenberg. He had 95 theses to debate and discuss. And you know what the number one was? Number one on his list was this thesis to discuss. It is Christ's will, I paraphrase, it is Christ's will that the life of a believer be a life of repentance. 
And I think that's right on. Because do we continue to slip up and sin and be pulled away from God? Yes. So the life of a follower of Jesus is a life of repentance. And we wish to maintain this attitude, and this calls for humility. Third, in regard to miracles, by holding the right balance of seeking miracles, but not overemphasizing them. Let's not obsess about it and freak out if we don't see stuff, but neither let's not be so humdrum, be like, well, it's never going to happen to me, so I'm not even going to ask. Let's be confident and faithful in believing that God will intervene as he has promised according to his will. All right, well, we're going to celebrate communion. So those of you who are prepared to help us, you can start getting ready. As I think about it, what's my main point? Don't stop responding to what Christ has done for you. Here is a chief strategic practice that God has built into his church to force us to come to grips with, to be reminded of what Christ has done for us. And notice communion or the Lord's Supper, this involves more than just our brain, our brains. You know, we are not just brains on sticks. We have bodies, right? And so here is a practice that involves our body as we take the bread, his body, and eat it and bring it within us, showing our unity, our oneness with him. We drink the cup, his blood, inside of us physically. So here is a reenactment, if you will, of our union with Jesus. And as we take the bread and the cup, it is a re-welcoming, if you will, of Jesus into our lives, and it is a recommitment. So let's do this, all right? We're going to have some instrumental music playing. The ushers will come and pass the bread along. Take one. And um, just, look, bow your head. Close your eyes, except when you sense the bread's coming. Um, and just cast your eye over your life, okay? Our life is to be a life of repentance, what are those things that God is calling us to turn from and to seek him in? Let's reflect now here in this time and what he has done for us, chiefly in the salvation he has granted on the cross. Okay, well, today we looked at this passage where we see insight of Jesus into what he expected his own miracles should have brought forth, namely repentance. But yet we understand how this can be because if you're like me, you have a sense of that our hearts do tend to explain away or forget or be distracted from what God has done instead of bringing forth the faith and repentance that we would like to see. So bottom line for us, we said this. Don't stop responding to what Christ has done for you. Don't stop responding to what Christ has done for you. Because again, sometimes our problem is not that God doesn't do stuff. God doesn't show stuff. Rather, the problem is following through with our end of the bargain, including this give me a sign sort of thing. So look at this little video I found on the internet. Here's a guy who said, God, give me a sign. Is this woman the woman for me? I'll release these heart-shaped balloons. Bring them to heaven, God. Ah, uh uh-oh. Hmm, sign from God there. Now, of course, that's not really what we mean when we're talking about sign from God. This is not a sort of reading the omens to try to figure out our direction in life. Nothing to do with that. Rather, we're really talking signs from God in the sense that Jesus performed them, signs of authentication for who he was. But similarly, whatever we've experienced of God, whatever we've seen, uh, let's not stop responding to that. Let's remember that and celebrate it. And if you're here and you've never really responded to the offer of the kingdom that Jesus gave, let me urge you, do it. Come, confess your faith in Jesus as Lord. Put your trust in him. Repent formally. Turn your life away from the path it was on. Submit to baptism and join us in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Yes, Father, we pray that you will warm our hearts by your spirit. Help us to remember all those things you've done for us. Uh, Not only those interventions and experiences of you we may have had in this life, but Even more than that, that great work you did on our behalf, which we remember and reenact and celebrate here today in communion. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.